All right, everyone, it is seven o'clock, so we are going to get started. My name is Alyssa, and I work at LaughQ, and welcome to LaughQ Listen and Learn Space in Science. So we're happy to have you here with us this evening. And just a few um, things before we get started, a few housekeeping things. Um, if everyone could keep their lines muted so we don't have any background noise. Um, we will ask you throughout the program if you can unmute. Uh, we'll ask for some feedback, so feel free to do that, but then just remute yourself if you could. Um, we're excited to have you here with us this evening. If you are not familiar with LabQ Listen and Learn, a little bit about our program. Um, it is a virtual reading and learning program that we have at LabQ. We partner with our local libraries um, to bring programs just like this one this evening um, for virtual reading and learning um, to share that with our community. So we're very happy to be here and we're very happy to have partnered with Briggs District Library, which is in St. John's this evening. So thank you to Briggs um, for partnering with us. And we also have Impression 5, and Abrams Planetarium who have partnered with us as well. So we're very excited um, to bring you lots of learning and reading this evening. So we will get started. And first up, I would like to introduce Erin with Briggs District Library. Take it away, Erin. Okay, welcome everyone. I'm so happy that you could join us here tonight. I'm Miss Erin. I work at the Briggs District Library in St. John's. I'm the programming librarian. And I'm just so happy to be part of this partnership with um, LaughQ and Abrams and Impression 5. But um, I wanna share some fun things that are happening at the library this summer. We have um, some summer story times that you can come join us for. We have um, cooking classes. We have our summer reading program that's happening right now. And when you sign up for the summer reading program, you can complete challenges to earn prizes for the summer. And we also are excited because we have a couple new story walks going up in our community. And um, we hope that you guys can check those out so you can read a story while you walk along the path. And also, we encourage you to check out our YouTube channel where we have how-to cooking videos and how-to craft videos. And um, all this information is at our website on www.briggsdistrictlibrary.org. And um, I'm also excited to um, introduce the book that I, I'm going to read tonight. I'm not going to read it. Uh, it's a recording of me reading it, but it's called Rocket Looks Up. And it's about a young girl who's very enthusiastic about looking up. And she encourages her neighbors and family to come together to um, look for something in the sky. So I encourage you all to look up and um, see what this world has to offer. So thank you for joining me. Rocket says look up. Written by Nathan Bryan, illustrated by Dapo Adiola, published by Random House Children's Books, a division of Penguin Random House. Every night before bed, I set up my telescope and wish upon a star. Mom tells me that I never stop looking up, and my head is always floating in the clouds. But she can't tell me that I look up more than my big brother Jamal looks down at his silly phone. Jamal says I'm called Rocket because I've got fiery breath. But mom says it's because a famous rocket blasted off into space the day I was born. All I know is that one day I'm going to be the greatest astronaut star catcher, space walker who has ever lived, like Mae Jemison, the first African-American woman in space. Did you know that Mae Jemison went into orbit around Earth in the space shuttle Endeavor, even though she is afraid of heights? I'm totally prepared. I've defied gravity. 
captured rare and exotic life forms, and built a ship to the stars. For today's mission, I'm going to see something incredible, the Phoenix Meteor Shower. I want everyone to see it with me, so I've made some flyers to hand out. Jamal is going to take me to the park to see the meteor shower, but first we have to go to the supermarket. While he is looking for the milk, I will be trying to find the astronaut food. Did you know meteor showers happen when Earth moves through the, the trail of dust left by a comet? Did you know most meteors are smaller than a grain of sand? Did you know meteors are bits of dust burning up in the atmosphere? Did you know the best time to see a meteor shower is when it's dark with no clouds? In the supermarket, when Kathy the cashier isn't looking, I grab the microphone. For one night only, come out and witness the amazing Phoenix meteor shower and everyone looks up. Kathy takes her microphone back as I hand out my flyers to the other people in the line. I think Jamal might be a tiny bit annoyed with me. The Phoenix meteor shower will be coming soon. We'd better drop off the shopping and get to the park fast. Look out! Ha ha, that wouldn't have happened if you had just looked up. Now Jamal is even more annoyed with me, and he says he won't take me to the park anymore. But when we get home, Mom saves the day. Come on, Jamal, she says. Put the phone down and take your little sister to the park. Yes! I jump up and do my famous victory dance around the room. I grab my jetpack backpack, but Jamal is still glued to his game. Wait till I complete this level, Rocket, he grumbles. And as we're about to leave, the doorbell rings. Wow, it's half the people from my street, and they're all holding my flyers. To the park, I yell at the top of my lungs. Everyone is so excited. My neck is aching from staring up into the night sky, but I won't stop. I can't miss it. Suddenly, the park goes silent. Even the birds are holding their breath. Everyone points their telescopes and binoculars up to the sky. Everyone but Jamal, who is still looking down at his phone. I think I see it, I shout, but it's just a plane flying overhead. Everyone moans and groans. We wait and wait and wait. One by one, people start to leave. Maybe the Phoenix meteor shower was a myth after all. Maybe that's why Jamal didn't want to come along. Maybe everyone is upset with me for wasting their time. I've never, ever felt this sad before. Jamal looks at me for the first time today. It feels like the first time ever. I've turned my phone off, sis, he says. I'm sorry for making you wait for nothing, Jamal. Let's go home. Suddenly, there's a big bright light in the sky. <gasps> Look up! The Phoenix meteor shower. I'm speechless, Jamal says. He pulls out his thermos and pours me a cup of hot chocolate. Yummy. We both sit down on the hill, watching meteors zoom across the sky. I'm so happy we looked up and saw them together. Did you know, one day I'm going to have a meteor shower named after me. The end. Wow. Thank you so much, Erin, for that beautiful story. And if you guys enjoyed that, can you please unmute yourself and tell Miss Erin, great job. Good job. Great, great job. job. <laughs> Thank you, Erin, for that story.
And next up, we are going to introduce to you Dr. Shannon. And Dr. Shannon is with Abrams Planetarium. So if you're not familiar with Abrams Planetarium, they are an astronomy and space science center um, on the campus of Michigan State University. So welcome, Dr. Shannon. We're very excited to have you with us this evening. Thank you. Um, and I love that story. Um, as soon as we, we heard what story it was going to be, I went and checked it out from, from my local library and I read it. And what I love about this story about Rocket telling everyone to look up is that's exactly what we do at the planetarium. We tell we have folks come visit us at the planetarium, which you can see behind me, and we have them look up in a theater, but it's not so that they could just watch a movie there, it's so that when they leave, they can look up in the real sky and see what's up there. So we're going to watch a video that uh, was recorded that shows um, what stars and constellations and planets are up in the night sky right now, and also what you can look for forward to this summer, the rest of the summer, including when you can check out the Perseid meteor shower. So if you want to go see a meteor shower, just like Rocket, you can do that as well this summer. We've got a really great one coming up in August. It's going to peak in mid-August. And you can also come visit us um, at the planetarium. Now we are actually open for public shows again um, as of last weekend. So uh, you can learn more information at our website, which is abramsplanetarium.org, including how you can get tickets in advance. Um, but I hope you enjoy this. And after today, you are inspired to go look up Just Life Rocket outside. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Shannon from the Abrams Planetarium at Michigan State University. And we're going to go take a look at what we can see in the sky this summer if we just go out and look up. And we're going to take a look at constellations, planets, and how best to go see the Perseid meteor shower late this summer. So we're going to use a software called Stellarium. You can download it for your own computer for free from stellarium.org where there is an online web-based version as well, or an app for a smartphone for a few dollars in any app store that you might use. But this is a, a really great software. And so I have a set to today at just as the sun is setting. So you can see we're set to June 30th, right at sunset here. And the great thing about Stellarium is I can speed time up and we can go and wait for the sun to set and for the stars to come out. It should only take a few moments. And we're gonna stop right here, even when we still have some of that lovely glow from the sun. Because the first thing I want us to take a quick look at is Venus and Mars. Now Venus is really bright planet. It's the brightest of the planets. The only things brighter than Venus in our sky are the sun and the moon. So if you have a clear view of the west, you might be able to see Venus and Mars nearby. And the reason why I wanted to point out Venus and Mars is because if we watch them day by day, so we're gonna skip ahead one day at a time, we will see that over the next couple of weeks, they will get closer and closer and closer until June or July 13th when they are at their closest. And when they are at their closest like this, it is called a conjunction. And if we zoom in a little bit, we can see, and this is what it would look like outside as well, that there is still a gap between them. There will be about the same gap between them as the moon is wide in our night sky. So they won't be right on top of each other, but they will be very close. And over the next two weeks, you can watch them get closer and closer. But let's go back to today and see what else we can go find. So let's go speed time up so that we can get entirely into the nighttime. We watch Venus and Mars set and we'll stop here. Now this is at about 11 or so tonight, 11.15. You might need to stay up past your bedtime to see this. Uh, but let's take a look at what we can see in the north. And one of the first things to look for when you go outside is the Big Dipper. 
the Big Dipper. It looks like a big square spoon or a ladle in the sky. You can see it right here in the northwest, kind of high in the sky in the summertime. So we have three stars for the handle and four stars for the bowl part of the dipper. Now the Big Dipper is a shape that's very easily recognizable, but it's not the official name of the constellation. It actually is Ursa Major or the Big Bear, and there's a lot more stars associated with it. But the Big Dipper itself is going to be the easiest part of that to spot. And it's really handy because you can use those outer two stars here of the bull and draw a line and continue over and you find the North Star, which is part of the Little Dipper or Ursa Minor, the Little Bear. So we have Ursa Major and Ursa Minor. Now you might have noticed that these um, stars in the Little Dipper, they're kind of hard to see. You can see the North Star and the outer two stars of the Little Dipper, but the rest of those stars are pretty hard to see. The more of them that you can see, that means the darker your sky. So you just need to get outside of the city and away from city lights to see those. But let's take a look at what we could see if we got outside of those city lights. So I'm going to go on here and change a quick setting. If we can get away from the city lights, now you can see all of that little dipper. But you can still see a good chunk of it even if you live in the city. So don't worry too much. And that's just a good guidepost for how dark your sky is. If you have trouble finding it, the Little Dipper pours into the Big Dipper. Another great constellation in the north is right over here on the opposite side of the North Star from the Big Dipper. And it's this W shape, and this is Queen Cassiopeia. And in Greek mythology, she was a queen of Ethiopia. So these are some really great constellations to go outside and find. And the great thing is, if for these ones in the north, you can look up any night of the year and you will see these ones, the ones toward the north. Now let's turn towards the south and see what else we can see in the summertime. So I'm going to back up just a little bit here and I'm going to point out just a few of my favorites that are the easiest to find in the summer. One is actually really low in the sky, it's this curly shape and it is a big bug with a curly tail. This is Scorpius the Scorpion right here. So we have Scorpius the Scorpion marked by the bright star Antares, which comes from uh, uh, the Latin for not Mars. So that one's not Mars. Um, and next to it, we have this little teapot shape. And if you want to, you can sing, I'm a little teapot, short and stout. Here is my handle and here is my spout. Um, and so this is Sagittarius the Archer. So this little teapot shape marks Sagittarius the Archer. So these are two very low constellations, but they're pretty bright and you can go outside and find those. Um, but if we look over here in the east and look up, we have this triangle of three bright stars, the brightest of which is called Vega. And Vega is part of Lyra the Harp. We have Deneb, which is part of Cygnus the Swan. And we have Altair, part of Aquila the Eagle. And so this summer triangle is pretty nice to spot. Vega will actually get very, very high in our sky. And once you find that summer triangle, you can find all of these other constellations as well. So those are some of the easiest ones to find in the summertime. But let's take a quick look real quick. Let's turn on all the constellations. There we go. And here's all the art. There are 88 official ones. So we pointed out a few of the brighter ones and easier ones to find during the summer, but there's a lot more that you can go and explore on your own, just like Rocket did. And one other thing, let's go a little bit later into the night. Okay, a lot later. Um, or rather, let's go back to where we were at about 11, but let's skip ahead to mid-August. So when we do that, so later into the summer, 
First, we will also see Jupiter and Saturn in late summer, so we can go ahead and see those guys, uh, some more planets. But I'm going to turn on something else here, and it is our meteor shower buttons. So it marks all the different meteor showers. So just like Rocket explained, meteor showers are regular things that happen every year at the same time because it's the leftover debris from a comet's tail. So we always hit that debris at the same time of year, every time. And one of the best ones to go outside and see are called the Perseids. And the Perseids peak in mid-August. So about August 11th and 12th are going to be the best nights to go outside and see the Perseids. And the best way to go look for these meteors uh, during a meteor shower is to go get a comfy chair, a blanket, some hot cocoa, and just stay up as late as you can staring at the sky. And if you stay out for an hour or two in comfy conditions, you'll probably get to spot a few of them in an hour. So go outside, look up, explore the world, and experience it just like Rocket wants everyone around her to do. Thank you so much, and you guys have a great rest of your night. Your night. Thank you, Dr. Shannon. And if you guys enjoyed learning about astrology, can you tell Dr. Shannon that was awesome? That was awesome. That was awesome. awesome. Great. <laughs> Wonderful. And I know you guys have lots and lots Thank of you. questions. So at this time, Dr. Shannon will take a few questions. So please unmute yourself and ask away. It said that um, many of the the meteor, is it meteorites or meteors that come into the atmosphere um, are small as a grain of sand. If that's true, why are we so concerned with maybe something hitting Earth someday? So um, they're constantly coming through our atmosphere. Um, and so most of them are only about the grain of uh, a grain of sand and they burn up completely. Or if there's anything left over, it, it is something very, very small. You can actually go um, and take like a magnet through your downspouts and you can actually pick up some of those. You, you have to do some sifting, but you can pick some of those up. But there's also larger rocks that can fall through our atmosphere and leave a larger chunk behind. Those are rare. So meteor showers happen with regularity and they're they're really tiny. Um, but there's also some bigger ones that we keep an eye on just in case. Um, so uh, and so like there was one that landed in Michigan in 2018. That was a pretty large chunk, but it was very loosely packed. And so it actually broke up into smaller chunks and about 30 of those have been recovered so far, but none of them were bigger than a golf ball. Um, so there was no damage or anything from it. So, so we do want to keep track of the larger space rocks out there that might come through our atmosphere, but most of them are, are harmless. And if we're lucky, we get to have a piece of it left over that we can check out. Thank you for that question. Anybody else have any additional questions you want to ask? Ask? Dr. Shannon, how did you get interested in this wonderful, fascinating work? It, it started for me in high school, actually. Um, I had um, a class period I had to fill up, and the only one that I could fit into my schedule was physics. And I, I remember being a little intimidated by the idea of physics because it seemed everything that showed me in the movies growing up was that it, it was a really difficult topic. But what physics really is, is helping us understand the world around us. It helps explain why why we get sparks when we rub our socks on the on the carpet or um, why our balls roll down a hill. All of that is physics and it's something that we actually experience every day. So I really fell in love with that class. And then what I really liked was all the stuff in space and getting to understand the stuff in space um, and especially black holes. And so if it if it weren't for uh, that that one class in high school, I think um, Maybe I, I probably would have been a violinist or something or a, a doctor, but um, that was a goal for a while. But I took physics and it was it was. Here I am. 
All right, we have we'll take this last question from the comments from Abby and she asks, when is the next big meteor coming? Um, so the next like big meteor, those are, we can't really predict. We don't really know when those ones will come. What we can predict are the meteor showers. Um, so the next good one, so to speak, the next one that will have a lot of meteors that we can go outside and see, um, but won't result in a really big one. That'll be the Perseids in, um, in August is when they peak. Most meteor showers last about three or four weeks, but they have a peak. Um, and then the next really good one will be the Geminids, which will be in uh, November, December. So those are some really great ones to go go check out. So get get comfy, get some warm drink, and go watch for those lovely streaks of light in our sky. Well, thanks again, Dr. Shannon. That was some great information. Um, up next, we have, I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name, Mikaela from Impression 5. Um, she's gonna come and talk a little bit about Impression 5 and also some of the activities that they have going on. I'm super excited to be here tonight with all of you. There's, I'm learning a lot, which is really great. Um, importantly, I'm just excited to be here with all of you. Impression 5 Science Center, hands-on science center, downtown Lansing. Um, if you have not been there before, things to anticipate or look out for is that we have a lot of hands-on activities or what we call exhibits to kind of explain, explore science. And a couple of our popular exhibits in bubble room, giant bubble all around you. There are spaces like spectrum, which is all about exploring light and color. So there's shadow wall, there's um, a play with where you can play with shadows, giant light, a colleague on this line with me. Nick had a really cool activity that he has uh, put together to be able to share with you. Hi, I'm Nick from Impression 5 Science Center, and I'm here to talk to you today about the vacuum of space and the experiments that scientists and astronauts are doing up in space right now to help us learn more. One important person who's been up to space and studied what it's like to live there is May C. Jemison. May Jemison is a doctor, an engineer, an astronaut, and more, and she's still alive. She became an author this year too, writing an autobiography. She's the first African-American woman to go to space and worked as a science mission specialist with NASA. She worked on experiments with bone cells, experiments to make safe water and saline solutions for medical treatments, and worked with frog eggs and tadpoles, seeing how they lived in zero gravity. Scientists' experiments in space investigate all sorts of things, including low gravity and different atmospheres, like the vacuum of space. The experiments May C. Jemison did focus more on low gravity or no gravity, because low gravity makes it hard for all sorts of living things. One way I like to think about it is when you're mixing things. Our body mixes things all the time, mixing nutrients from food you ate into the cells in your body to feed them, mixing the air you breathe into your blood to move it around your body, and more. But mixing doesn't work the same if you don't have gravity. Heavy things won't sink and light things won't float. Mostly they just stay where they are. If I wanted to make myself a sweet drink by adding something to my water, I'd need to shake really hard to make sure it was dissolving if there's no gravity. But it's not just zero gravity experiments that scientists are doing in space. Because space has no air. It's a vacuum. There's all sorts of cool experiments that you can do in a vacuum. Now the scientists have to be safe. They have to either wear their spacesuit or stay inside of their space shuttle or space station that's full of air. But we want to reproduce some of these experiments here on Earth. The zero-g ones are hard because we have gravity here on Earth, so we can't do experiments that rely on not having gravity. But we can do experiments with a vacuum and with air pressure. Now we've got some of these experiments that my coworker Sandy has filmed and I want to show those to you right now. Now the first experiment I have to show you is pretty simple. We have a balloon. For this experiment, we'll show you the whole vacuum chamber. So you can see the tube in the lower left corner where we're pulling the air out of the big clear vacuum chamber. And you can see something interesting about air in this experiment. As the air is pulled out of the big clear chamber, there's still some air trapped inside the balloon because we tied a knot in it. Now air pushes against the walls of the containers that it's inside, and that pushing is called air pressure. So as we remove air from the vacuum chamber, the air pressure inside the balloon inflates the balloon making it look like we're adding more air, even though we aren't. Finally, at the end here, we let the air rush back into the chamber. 
This air pushes back on the balloon, blowing it around and shrinking it back down to its original size. Now this next experiment shows why it can be dangerous for scientists to be out in a vacuum and why they need to be protected when they're in space. Here you can see a beaker filled with water. This is just normal tap water, but pretty much all water has some air dissolved in it. The water and blood in our body is the same, carrying gas that's important to keep us healthy. As we pull the air out of our vacuum chamber, we can see bubbles forming inside the water. We aren't adding any heat, but it looks like it's going to start boiling. As we keep removing air, the bubbles get bigger and bigger until eventually they can push past the water and bubble out the top. Eventually we pull most of the air out of the water and when we remove the vacuum and let the air back into the chamber, the bubbling stops. Now this third experiment is a short one. We've got a burning candle. We need oxygen in the air to breathe and candles need oxygen in the air to burn. With this experiment, you can see that when we remove the air with a vacuum, the candle can't burn and it goes out. This is why scientists need to make sure they have air when they go up to space. And finally, because slime is everyone's favorite, including ours, we asked what would happen if you put slime in a vacuum. Now, what you might know about slime is that the molecules that make up slime are like a big net. They trap a bunch of water inside, making the slime wet and squishy without getting your hands wet. But they also trap air inside. As we pull air out of the chamber with the vacuum, the air inside the slime keeps pushing, making the slime expand. This experiment is a great one to show off everything we've learned today. The slime bulges out of the beaker, expanding up and up like a balloon. The air in the water of the slime expands too, like the bubbling water in the beaker. The slime keeps expanding until eventually it can't hold itself up and it flops over. You can even see the big bubbles being formed inside the slime. These bubbles are made with the air that was already inside the slime. All we're doing is removing air to make a vacuum, which lets the air in the slime push up and out. Finally, when we let all the air back into the chamber, the air inside the slime can't keep it inflated and the slime deflates. So from our experiments today, we can see why it's so important to keep ourselves safe when we go to space. Air is important for us to breathe, but we can also see that by removing the air around us, the air inside of us wants to leave. By wearing a spacesuit or staying inside a space station where we're surrounded by air, we can make sure we're safe and healthy and learning more about the universe around us. Thank you so much for joining me today at Impression 5 Science Center. Thank you so much, Nick, and thank you, Impression 5, for those awesome experiments. If you enjoyed learning about those, give your um, unmute yourself, give Nick and Impression 5 a thumbs up, Say thank you or yay. Oh, thank great you. job. Great. Awesome. Good job. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, we have time for a few questions for impression five. So if any of you have a question you would like to ask at this time, go ahead and unmute yourself or you can go ahead and put it in the chat as well. And we'll take a few of those. I have one. How does the vacuum work? And is it like the vacuum cleaner that we have in our house? Yeah, that's an awesome question. Um, I actually have the vacuum here, I'm going to show you, but it is a lot like the vacuum cleaner that we have in our houses. Um, so I'm going to turn you around real quick. Well, actually, no, I'll just bring it up here. Here we have the chamber. So you can see the little tube where we suck the air out. Essentially, what we've got is we've got a big fan attached to a tube that only lets things go through one way most of the time. So the fan will move the air and it pulls it out of the, um, the vacuum chamber. And as the air moves through the tube, this is the fan, it's really, really big and really heavy. But yeah, as it pulls the air out of the tube, um, it, the air can't get back in because there's a spot in the in the big fan piece that I just showed you that that prevents the air from moving back into it until we release the air at the end. So um, just like the vacuum cleaner at home where you create a current to suck stuff up, it's just home where you create a current to suck stuff up. It's just the vacuum cleaner at home it has the chamber in there to trap all the dirt and dust inside instead of trapping all of the air until you release it. So there's one little difference, but yeah, it's pretty similar. Good. Thank you. And is there any other cool things you have put in your vacuum chamber besides what you showed us tonight?
So first things to bring out when we have some spare time and we've got guests visiting. Um, so we've done everything from um, shaving cream to marshmallows to um, so things like glitter and confetti, which don't really do much as you're sucking the air out. But when you let all the air back in, you create this big puff that's like a snow globe inside. Um, the marshmallows are really neat because if you get one of the big jumbo ones, they can inflate to fill most of the vacuum chamber. Uh, so they they get really huge. Um, so if you're if you're at impression five, um, we probably won't be doing it every day. But we have some small handheld pressure chambers that you can that you can play with if they're out. And sometimes we'll add that the vacuum chamber out as well. All right. If put anybody does in there, oh, go ahead. Have you ever put an egg in there? An egg. Oh, an egg. Oh, I haven't done an egg. Before I think I know they explode in the microwave. I wouldn't be surprised if you could get an egg to pop in the vacuum chamber too, because um, because an egg's filled with a liquid, right? And so if you, if you pull all of the pressure out, there's a chance that it might pop. Um, it might be something worth doing, but from cleaning up the microwave, cleaning up eggs are not the easiest job in the world. So we might we might save that for a day where we've got some extra time to clean our vacuum chamber after. But that's a great idea. All right. Thank you for those questions. And thank you, Nick, and everyone from Impression 5 um, for all that. We all learned a lot, I think. Um, so up next, we are going to do our gift card giveaway drawing. So we are giving away three gift cards to Barnes and Noble and um, our three winners are Alyssa Van Deventer, Susan French, and Brandon Linton. So congratulations to all of you and you'll be receiving an email from us that will have your gift card. So congratulations and thank you for attending tonight. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, so that is all we have for you this evening. We're so, so glad you were able to join us. And thank you so much to Abrams Planetarium at Michigan State, Briggs District Library, and Impression 5 Science Center for partnering with us and bringing us um, so much that we learned tonight in our wonderful story. We hope that you learned a lot and we hope you have a great evening so thank you for being with us